Hi, welcome again to Off the Page. My guest today is Michael Moriarty. Uh, he's an actor. You've probably seen him in Law and Order, American TV show. He also writes novels and a very interesting autobiography called The Gift of Stern Angels. Good to have you here. Thanks. Nice to be here. Now, I open up this book and I see that Michael Moriarty says he's uh, having a one-man war against the federal government. And this is the U.S. federal government. Yes, well, what the I mean, heck was a, that all about? A little grandiose, although I tend to be that way in the book a bit. Yeah. But, um, well, yeah, there was a one-man war. Nobody joined me. You were all alone. I was at the barricades all by myself. And what was the issue? What were you fighting? I was fighting Janet Reno's effort to blackmail network television with the threat of unconstitutional legislation. Censorship. She broke the law, broke the First Amendment. She also is an attorney general, right? Yes. What is her job? To prosecute laws that are written. At that time, there wasn't even a Children's Television Act. She came out of her own imagination and her own sense of her own power I started libeling something she had no right to do, to threaten and humiliate and bully network executives. And how did this connect up with you? Why did you take the responsibility to go after her? <laughs> I, I still haven't been able to answer that. Well, I, I was saying, you know, a mongoose doesn't know he's a mongoose till he meets a snake. Help me out here. When the snake appeared, inside the mongoose, an energy level and being erupts like a volcano. And he's destined to attack the snake. And that's what happened. It's so primal. And there you are. And that's it. I didn't know what. I'm sitting here, and everything I am, and everything my father was, is erupting. And I'd been a liberal, say. Hmm. And suddenly I turn into this man so, so, so in love with individual rights and freedom that I don't believe myself. But it happened, and uh, it was predestined. Where were you? What were you doing at that time? You were, you I were still on a TV successful. show, right? I was very successful. I fought myself back up, you know, because my career is uh, checkered because um, I've been an alcoholic all my life, so that, that doesn't help, really. Hmm. Um, but. I'm, I'm there, you know, I got ma um, making almost a million dollars a year, law and order, everything's fine. I finally fought my way back up. And Dick Wolf, the producer, gets me involved in this meeting with Janet Reno. So you were there face to face? Oh, yeah, three hours over a tough chicken dinner in a hotel room. And, uh, and that blew my whole career out of the water. So was she saying something to you? You can't do this on television. We have to change the way you act, the stories that. that are told, that sort of thing? Beyond that. First words out of her mouth <coughs> were, I find it hard to believe that anyone in the entertainment industry could shed a tear over anything. You know, suddenly I felt a yellow star on my jacket. I felt a deep-seated, pathological loathing of anyone involved in television. She treated us like accessories to drive-by shooting. Did she believe that? Did she think Absolutely. that you were, you were promoting violence? Oh, oh, no question. What kind of elements? What, what on the show would happen? Or what in the story was was? Well, it wasn't just my show. Yeah. It wasn't just my show. It was, a, it was her whole idea, which was ingrained as a child. Her mother... Uh, through the television set out the window. Now, her mother was an alligator wrestler. Ooh. And yet she was terrified of the television. She yeah. taught her child there's nothing more evil than that television set. She brought all that disease to the Justice Department and started this one person supported by all these studies. I mean, there's another issue, which I don't go into there, but I've... Uh, Ten years prior to this encounter, the federal government started funding uh, studies of the effect of television on children. Now, these, these grants are handed through grant, you know, institutions, and the grant institution lets the professor know that basically what the government wants is how awful television is. See, they send all this money out, and yet 
the professor knows the results of his test before he writes it because he knows that the federal government wants a lot of evidence that television, journalists and artists are the cause of all violence in America. So all this money starts going out. And these studies are extraordinary. One of them in Washington, and I, it's in the book, he picks an example of, uh, of a society that didn't have television between 1947 and 1969. And he states that because of the absence of television, there was the lowest violence rate probably in the free world, the so-called free world. Now, that's his model society. Between 47 and 69, there was no television. Now, guess what society it was? Yeah, I don't know. South Africa. Hmm. Doesn't sound right, does South it? South Africa. Yeah. Huh? Here's how sick it gets. You know George Will? American writer. He puts it in his book. I mean, here's a man, extraordinary intelligence. He doesn't even see the nightmare of that metaphor. He even says, oh, this is, of course, just white on white violence. Now, that's like saying, in uh, Berlin in the 1930s, there was the lowest Aryan upon Aryan violence. Mm. Now, that's sick. That's pretty scary stuff. Now, what is this the whole thing for you with freedom of expression? Why, why did you take it so personally? <coughs> Obviously, you're in the business. It's tied up with your job, but it, it seems to go way beyond that. Why, why do you think that, that's so absolutely fundamental and important in our society? The Word is God, and God is the Word. If you shut people's mouths, you shut God right out of society. The Word is God and God is the Word. So you think it's, it's uh, a spiritual thing? Oh, no question. It's also the fabric of uh, what we fought for. It's called freedom. Yeah. It's a perfect metaphor huh, for God's ability to move mm -hmm. through the earth. And if you shut people's mouths, God can't talk. Mm -hmm. The artists can't talk. The journalists can't talk. So how did this affect you now with your, your job back as an actor on Law and Order? Uh, <laughs> did you read Unbearable Lightness of Being by Kandera? I did. You know the guy was a surgeon? No. At the beginning, you know, at the beginning of his career as a surgeon. Right. At the beginning of the book, he's a window washer. Yeah. They demote him. Take his job away. And this is because you spoke out against yeah. Janet Reno? Yeah. Tell finally, I have no choice, go to Canada. So that's why you're here in Canada. Yeah. You were looking for freedom of speech. No, no, I was passing through. Ah. I was headed to Amsterdam. For, I was going to leave Las Vegas. You know, when your country turns into the nightmare it's in now, you don't want to live. See. No what do I want to do? Fight and get a career, make yeah. a bit? And then I get to end up and find out that my boss and my boss's boss are run by this crazy lady in the Justice Department. And they got to take orders. And they're humiliated in front of me. They should have stuck up for me and stuck up for themselves. They didn't. Right. I did the Howard Stern show, and Howard said they should have stood up and, and said something. You, it wasn't your job, Michael, and it wasn't. I was window dressing. I was brought there because Janarina's assistant wanted to meet me. Maybe kind of stroke her a little bit and give her a little, you know, uh, <coughs> little touch of, or at least her assistant will touch a Hollywood or whatever. I mean, it's sick. Yeah. Well, I'm there. I'm an artist. I shouldn't have been in that meeting. They're playing CEO government games. I'm in the middle of a nightmare. Here in Canada, do you, do you feel anything like you're <coughs> sort of a refugee from America? Oh, American yeah, no, society? I just got, yeah. I'm now a landed immigrant. Yeah. I got it last weekend. I, I just crossed the border. I get a stamp, see? Hmm. Took me two and a half years. I'm very proud that I made it, despite my flaws. Uh, I love this country, and I want to be, uh, I want to work for it and live for it and die for it. Now, here you are, though. In the book, you, you certainly espouse these libertarian yeah. notions, right. and yet you've moved to a socialist country. Well, uh, I'm only here because I fell in love. I was just passing through. Yeah. And then I met Susie Q at the Economy Shoe Shop. No, no, I met her at the Cheers. No, no, it wasn't Economy Shoe. I met her at Cheers in a bar, and I fell in love, and, that, and that's, that's, that's why I'm here. And here you are, happily ever after, we all hope. Now, yes. the title of the book, Gift yes, of... Your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> a gift of yeah. Stern Angels. Who are those Stern Angels? I think Harold, uh, Howard Stern is one, is he? Yes, yes. But so is Janet Reno. Uh, she's the, the darker the dark one angel. in your book, yeah. No, no, no. The, the good and the bad, they work in a way in which you are formed by nothing defines you like an enemy. 
Friends are there, but nothing defines who you are until you meet your enemy. And they cut through everything else that you're not. And they push you to the wall. And what's left is you. Friends can never do that for you. Hitler defined Churchill. Without Hitler, we never would have known Churchill. You point out in your book there that Hitler was a teetotaler and that Churchill drank all day. Yep. He said, drink moderately all day. Which of the two did you admire oh, most? Oh, oh, no, oh, well, I mean, of course. I mean, Winston Churchill. He's my, uh, he's my hero of the 20th century. Yeah. He still is, even though I'm not drinking anymore. Now, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm three weeks sober, and I'll never take another drink. Of course, people are looking at me with John. We got you on me. TV saying this now. Yes, I will. I'll bet a thousand dollars. I mean, anybody will cough up, you know, and bet a thousand dollars. Five years from now, I'm still not drinking, and then you owe me five thousand dollars. I make a lot of money out of this. <laughs> I'm trying to encourage my, <laughs> okay. my recovery. <laughs> I'll do anything again, they can make money on it. Let's go back. Where did you grow up? You're <coughs> trying, telling me you're a child of the 40s. Yeah, yeah in 40s. Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, and Lily Tomlin said she left Detroit when she found out where she was. <laughs> yeah, when she was old enough. But what kind of a childhood did you have? Uh, well, no, not good. Alcoholic mother, functioning alcoholic father who saved me, you know, I mean, he's a little, he was a lot like Winston Churchill, mm -hmm. you know, very much of that period, that kind of thinking and that kind of uh, strength and enjoyment. I mean, love food, love wine, love uh, good times, you know, he work hard and play hard. That was his whole motto. But my mama couldn't keep up with him. He had her glass filled so often that she just moved, we, moved right off the cliff. And she wasn't a very good drunk, not a nice lady. So I woke up and, and I grew up in a kind of abusive atmosphere in which I, you know, um, but it made me an artist. You know, art is about uh, turning uh, pain and suffering into beauty. No pain, no comedy, no pain, no drama. You have to suffer to do it well? We have to know suffering. You know, and, that, and if you do the miracle of making pain beautiful, people sit there and they say, my gosh, you know, there is something beautiful about my own suffering and my own pain and my own mistakes, my own flaws, there, there is something beautiful there. And that's a gift, you know. Yeah. Art's not a, a luxury, it's a necessity to get, keep people alive, I think. Okay, Michael, we're going to take a very short break and we'll be back with Michael Mariarty right after this. This got Welcome from. back to Off the Page. <laughs> uh, my guest here is Michael Moriarty. He's dancing away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Next life, you're going to be a dancer, huh? Well, I, I, I just always wanted to. My first wife was a, a wonderful dancer with Robert Joffrey, and I've always loved to dance. But um, my uh, two heroes, uh, Fred Astaire and George Balanchine, the choreographer. Now, Balanchine said the greatest dancer in the world was Fred Astaire, and he wasn't a ballet dancer. And there's something true about that. The grace and angelic quality of Fred Astaire is so breathtaking. And the smallest little things, just one little gesture, you know, take your breath away. There's two of your heroes. Who else are your heroes? <coughs> this, um, this front of uh, free speech and speaking your mind. Other heroes I in your life? Well, uh, the greatest man I ever walked the earth was Jesus of Nazareth. And I personally think that the greatest cop out an insult to Jesus was to call him God. Explain. Well, first of all, he said no. The, the disciples came to him and said, um, called him rabbi and father, and he said, no, 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 no. Call no man your father. Your father's in heaven, and heaven is within. Now we have thousands of years of institutions calling him God. Now, guess what happens? People want to learn from him. Don't learn because they say, well, it really doesn't apply to me. Because he was a god. Hmm. I'm just a human being. You mentioned in your book that you, you <coughs> identify strongly with the icon of the crucifixion. Well, it's all our lives. We've all been accused uh, falsely. We've all endured uh, you know, false testimony in small ways, nothing like he faced. And we've also deal with, uh, dealt with the fact that we have sins 
which we hadn't been accused about because we they didn't know about them. So the strange mixture of your culpability and your innocence, and the only metaphor and symbol that deals with that profoundly is 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 Jesus, and he did it as a man. I, if I had another life, I'd start a church called the Church of the Greatest Man, and I wouldn't let anyone come in there and start to say that he wasn't a man, that he was God. I mean, then that, that, that takes all the burden away from us. Yeah. We have no obligation to even approach his life as it's accessible to us or possible. I mean, that is just, I mean, I, 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 the pain that the ghost of Jesus must be in from what they've done to him and twisted him and marketed him into something he never was, and he predicted it. Many will come in my name, and they're uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. You've gone through some big, big changes over the last five yep. years of your life. Uh, beyond what's written about in this book, you're mentioning to me that you're working on a, another autobiographical, another autobiographical book. What, um, no. What's it about? How are you changing? Oh well, uh, yeah, the title of it is uh, "My Boat Is a Barstool: A Logbook of an American Noah." Where are you sailing to? Well, I've, I've found port. My ark is right here in Bedford, Nova Scotia, and I have my family. And I have my boat, and I'm moored right here. And I sit, and I read the New York Times, and I look down at the states like a flood's coming. I think it is. I really do. And I'm so glad I'm here uh, uh, that I don't have to go down there anymore. How can Canada be that different for you? Well, when I gave up this relationship to the idea of my country being the United States of America, I, I adopted a larger idea, which is the English-speaking peoples. And that, and Churchill said it best, he wrote the history of the English-speaking peoples, he said the common denominator between the entire history of the English-speaking peoples is individual freedom. We are its creator, its protector, and its guarantor. And that's what I am part of, of the English-speaking peoples. I don't consider myself anymore an American. Hmm. Now, you gave a speech down there somewhere in um, New England, I believe, with the title, The Fear of Freedom, suggesting that people are afraid today of oh, it's terrifying. being free. No, free, freedom. Freedom, confronting your own free will and freedom, is a, no, it's very terrifying. I mean, Janice Joplin said, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Um, to a certain extent, that's true. And you have, to be, you have to find out what you're willing to lose in order to find out what it is to be free. And I've been free. And I started doing a program on CNBC called Life Without Fear, and that's been my, my dream, to live a life without fear. It's impossible, but it's a good goal. And the principle I live by is <coughs> the only devil is fear, the only sin is despair, and the only law is the golden rule. Don't do on another human being what you wouldn't want done to yourself. And that's my life. Where does all this fear come from? The internal fear, the personal fear that you have, that I have, that, that little kids grow up with. A necessity to the extent we've got to be humbled. I mean, the last five years of drinking have humbled me. I humiliated me. I humiliated myself. So fear is a part of keeping your humility. But that's before God. Fear before God is, is important. Fear before another human being is wrong. If you were to look back ten years, your, yourself, ten years you know, ago, could do I have you, a mic? I don't know where. I'm, oh, there yeah, it is. Yeah, you're there. Could you, you imagine over? yourself? Yeah, you stepped that on today, as me. the person that you are, ten years ago, would you ever envisioned yourself oh, no, to be no, the person you are today? No, 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 no. What no, were you no, thinking no. about? Where well, were you I mean, I was be? thinking about uh, everything else. Everybody else, a careerist. You know, that's my. Uh, 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 this is. The human race is ninety-nine percent careerism. It is for career. And I played a terrible example of a careerist in the Holocaust in 1977, Dorf. He wasn't a racist. He had no strong political motives. All he wanted to do was get ahead, keep a job, and he ended up utterly and completely corrupt and uh, demonized by the Nazi party. And all he wanted to do was put food on the table buy himself a house, get promoted, 
And he never had the rabid anti-Semitism. He never had a strong political. He was what Hannah Arendt said, make that machine work, the banality of evil. And the most banal people in the world are careerists. That's all they believe in. And it's everywhere now. Have you been able to cut yourself free from that? Well, I did it. I mean, I, I, listen, I, I, I resigned from law and order. That's a million dollar a year job. I lost my second wife. I left my country. I mean, was it a good so decision? I'm so immunized by the experience with Dorf. Well, great decision. I'm up here in Canada, which is the most wondrous nation in the world, I think, because of Parliament. Parliament is uh, the saving grace of the free world, not Congress. Parliament. They're very close in structure, no, they're not. but there's something they're different. They're not close at all. I'll tell you why. You've got five parties up here. Mm -hmm. And in Parliament, you can call the minister down on the floor in 10 seconds. You know what it costs to ask Janet Reno a question? How How about $20 million in an investigating committee. And when she gets there, she blackmails the people interrogating her. Waco investigation. That's a good story. Republicans are running the committee asking questions about Waco. Let's see. By now, the Oklahoma City bombing had happened, so Janine has got them on the run. It's interesting that in the midst of your uh, <coughs> trying to deal with the federal government and this, this battle for, for freedom against censorship, that the story is also a story about your personal search for freedom, but also happiness. It's a tough thing to do, isn't it, to, to search for happiness at the same time that, that you're fighting an adversary? Well, I up the stakes, a uh, 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 search for bliss. Bliss is happiness and pain, but uh, that's a human condition for adults. Happiness is for kids. Bliss is for adults. Bliss is a higher level? Well, it includes pain and suffering. Achievable in this plane, the mortal When you hear life. a great piece of music, mm -hmm. as a great piece of art, infiltrating that through the fabric of the mosaic of it is suffering. Of that comes an extraordinary new level of happiness is bliss. So um, I haven't stopped my pursuit of bliss. Well, Joseph Campbell, pursue your bliss. He was right. You're doing it. Now you do, you write music, you play music. Yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you tap into something higher? It's not a great work of art yet. But you're ready to make the leap? Oh, yeah. Any day? Oh, no? yeah. Any day? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm ready, ready to go. <laughs> Okay, um, my guest today has been Michael Mariarty. Uh, we're going to take a short break <coughs> and come back and say goodbye to him right after this. My guest is Michael Moriarty. Michael, you've got your yeah, final mind, 30 mind, seconds. Mind. I'd like to offer my services to uh, colleges and clinics and anyone who feels uh, that I can keep an open forum about alcoholism. I am intimately aware and acquainted with the life of alcoholism, and I think I can be of great help. And I really would like someone to give me a ring at the station or whatever, and let me know where I can show up for no fee and talk to people, particularly students, college students, about what they might face. Thanks a lot, Michael. Good man. Right. And thanks for watching Off the Page. I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.